Welcome to Central Bank Central. I'm Kathleen Hayes. We are all gearing up for the Fed Reserve's two-day meeting. It starts tomorrow, wraps up on Wednesday. What will we hear from the Fed, from the chair of the Fed Reserve, Jay Powell, about inflation, where it's heading, and what that means for policy? Well, to take a look at this in depth is someone who's actually one of our very first guest on uh, Central Bank Central, and that is Rob Kaplan. He's former president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. He was also vice chair of Goldman Sachs. He was on the faculty of the Harvard Business School as an associate dean, and uh, great to have you back, Rob. Good to see you, Kathleen. So let's let's set the table in December, okay? That was the, the big meeting, the pivot, the Fed's gonna be cutting rates three times in 2024. Inflation's gonna to continue to come down. Since then, what do we see? Well, inflation seems to have kind of steady, maybe plateaued, certain aspects rising again, particularly on the services side. We've got a very solid labor market, some would say strong. Uh, we've got all kinds of signs that the, the economy is still in pretty good shape. So with all that in mind, what uh, what do you expect to hear from Jay Powell? What should we hear from Jay Powell? I think the most important thing he'll communicate is that we're making progress on inflation, but but it uh, is still uncertainty. The economy is strong. Uh, if I were him, I would point out that the, there's bigger there's a bigger inflation issue with services than goods. There's goods disinflation. China being weak is a big part of that. Uh, and I think he'd be wise, uh, therefore, to keep 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 those options open, keep the Fed's op options open. There'll be a dot plot to refer to. Uh, I doubt it will have more than three cuts. It might be two to three. I will see. And he'll speak to that. Uh, and I think he'll be noncommittal as to timing. Uh, and keep his options open. I think they still want to turn over a few more cards before they make a decision. And I think he'll, uh, I think he should leave them flexibility to do that. Okay. Well, so Rob, what's going on in the economy? Uh, it, it, fair enough. At the beginning of the year, yes, inflation had come down a lot and it was a lot due to the, the drop in goods prices, right? In some cases, some, uh, some items even negative, right? Services, right were seeming to come down, but that's what slowed out. So let's let's pull this apart, okay? The labor force, that is an issue, right? Because you keep looking at, we keep looking at near, still near record low unemployment. Uh, we still look at jobs growing. Jobless claims are staying at a very low level. What's going on there? So it's a mixed economy, uh, meaning anything interest rate sensitive is actually pretty weak. I don't need to tell people real estate. I think it's affecting goods. It's affecting businesses' desire to keep inventory. I think it's affecting the banks uh, and their willingness to lend to small business. So there are certain people in the economy feel like, man, we're we're going through a rough patch right now. However, uh, you've heard me talk about this before. I still believe that the significant spending on the Inflation Reduction Act projects infrastructure act projects unspent arpa money is explaining why certain segments of the economy particularly anything construction related is surprisingly strong and there's a ripple effect around the country when there's a big project it tends to bolster services restaurants people are flying airlines are doing very well and so i think you see this kind of mixed bag and one of the reasons is you got historically restricted monetary policy, and I still believe that fiscal policy is relatively stimulative, and these project spending initiatives are stimulative and have a multiplier effect. And to put a bottom line on it, we're running, we ran last year 7% plus deficit as a percentage of GDP. Uh, in 2019, we were at full employment also, and the deficit was four and a fraction percent of GDP. And so uh, we're just running a higher level of deficits than we were pre-COVID, despite the fact that we spent so much money in 20 and 21 and ran very high deficits. Uh, 
we're we're still actually running elevated deficits even now. So uh, just just push that a little bit further for us. Uh, how much difference would you think it makes then for the Fed and what the Fed has to do? The Fed and and you know, kudos to the Fed, Jay Powell, all the Fed officials. No, we do want to get to two percent. Voice is saying, well they could stop at three or tolerate three for a while and let it come down more gradually. How much do those two things uh, oppose each other? These large deficits, 7% of GDP, as you say, in 2019, what was it about 2%? And at the same time, you've got uh, this sense of, um, you know, what's the Fed pushing against? The Fed doesn't seem to address that very much. Well, so four and a fraction percent deficit in 2019. By the way, two and a fraction percent in 2016, just that's by what, comparison. That's what the two percent was, yes. Uh, that's right. And, and today, last year, seven and a fraction. I think if tax revenues go up, the CBO, Congressional Budget Office is hoping it'll be six and a fraction, but we're at a higher level. So the long and the short of it is there's a couple other conflicting forces. Um, and and if I were at the Fed, my eye would be on services. Uh, goods, we've already got goods disinflation. The question is, given uh, we've got a decelerating job uh, labor force because of aging, we're noticing that there's been supply increases in labor. Looks like it's coming from immigration. Uh, the question is, will that sustain? If it does, that would ease some of the pressure uh, on the labor force. And we're seeing, I think that's the main reason the unemployment rate ticked up. It's not because there's lack of demand for workers, that there's more supply. Uh, that'd be welcome, actually, but will it sustain? And then the second thing, which we're sort of, they're trying to piece together, is is productivity actually stepped up? Can we get more uh, GDP per worker than we had before? That would be very welcome because that would explain how we can grow faster and still may, it may not be inflationary, but it's too soon to make a conclusion on that. So you got these counter forces and, uh, and, and the economy seems to be doing fine. And so when in doubt, I think the smartest thing to do there is manage the risk. I, I, I've said to you before, I don't think the Fed's in the prediction business. Uh, they're in the risk management business. And I think the smartest risk management thing to do now will, would be buy more time and assess this more and see if it clarifies what's going on here. Because I, I don't think it's clear right now. Well, I think, you know, the, for ever since the uh, summary of economic projections, uh, every three months, the Fed updates GDP forecast, unemployment forecast, inflation forecast, and then they go around the table as I understand it, and say, okay, so what? where do you think the funds rate should be, our key policy rate, given your view of the economy and all that? And so that's how we got the dots. Are the dots, you know, the critics say, that's the problem. As soon as you tell me your dot, you're in the forecasting business, even though the Fed says it over and over. No, it's just what we think on this day. We're not forecasting. We're not promising. Uh and all the more reason why people are going to be just, look, if the Fed says, if the median dot is two instead of three, that's going to be a big deal to the markets. Yeah, so this is where the, the Fed actually has been, if you just look at the dot plot, the Fed's been fairly consistent. It said three in December. I think where they got a little bit of out of position was in the press conference, Jay, uh, uh, Chairman Powell uh, gave a sense maybe a little more optimistic than he wanted to, and the market got way out ahead of them. Now the market's coming back actually to where they were in December, and mm -hmm. my guess is the next dot plot won't be that different than December. It might be a little weaker, but not a lot. And so uh, I think this is where communication is a big part of the job, and because the market's been all over the place. The Fed has actually been fairly consistent but they may be uh, have overreacted to some comments in a press conference. Uh, and if Jay, if Jay in this press conference tries to be more hawkish, they'll probably overreact to that. Uh, but I think in terms of the dot plot, it's been fairly consistent. And yes, to your point, they've been very consistent and clear. And I always was when I was there. This is not a forecast. 
It's my view today, and I may change it two weeks from now and certainly three months from now. And I think the market just has to understand that. Okay, risk management and what you said about the dots brings me back to a couple of points I want to dig a little bit deeper with you on. And one of them is labor force growth, because many economists are saying, oh, it's immigration. Well, we know a lot of people have come across the border the last couple of years, but we don't, I don't think we, there's any great data on are they working? Where are they working? Um, you know, uh, so it, it it kind of, it kind of I mean, this remains kind of a mystery because I think one of the points you've made is if I'm at the Fed managing risk, will the labor force keep growing or won't it? If it keeps growing, then you figure there's lots of people coming in, wages will grow, but not, you know, not pick up speed. Uh, and if we've gone through something like, you know, it goes up and now maybe it goes down again or the growth rate grows down, what's that going to mean for the Fed's calculus this year? So I'm sure the Fed has done a deep dive in trying to analyze uh, labor supply and what's going on with the increase. And there's a number of very outstanding people at the Fed. There's an uh, economist named Pierre Renius, who I think you know, at the Dallas Fed, who's, you know, I'd be, I'd be asking her advice during this period as to what she's seeing. It's not, based on all my conversations, it's not completely clear what's happening the, the the underlying fundamental trend is the population's aging, workforce growth is decelerating. And I, I must say, I don't know whether this labor supply increase will be sustained. Uh, the only thing I would say that's relevant, some people have, are a little taken aback that the unemployment rate ticked up to 3.9, it might tick up to four. If it happens because of labor supply, uh, I don't think the Fed will be terribly alarmed by, about that. Uh, if it happened because demand starts to taper and it's clear that people are not hiring, that's a different matter. But right now, it looks like a supply issue, which means to me, again, reinforces just stay, sit and watch. No, no urgency to act. Productivity. Um the you know the latest productivity numbers have been strong. Uh, people who follow productivity closely uh, say, well, you know, you can you can get a, a surge and then you can get it kind of flattening out again. What do you see there? And not only in terms of like a, a number forecast, but what it means for inflation, what it means for the Fed, and again, is this sustainable? More productivity, you can grow faster with less inflation. So I learned a long time ago in my business career. Sometimes the smartest answer is to say, I don't know. And I've read everything I get my hands on. I've talked to economists broadly. Uh, there's some good work and uh, and commentary by former Dallas Fed economist, Evan Koenig, who I think is outstanding, who has cautioned that maybe this won't be sustained. And the truth is, I think the jury's still out. Uh, you know, with all this technology investment, you'd think that it's not, it's not, unreasonable that you could have a step up in productivity. However, the counter is a big part of the economy is the service sector, and it's not so easy to get productivity growth in the service sector. So I think this is one more thing. This will reveal itself in time, but to me, it's not immediately clear. The reason it's a big deal, I mentioned how leveraged we are as a, as a economy. We're now debt to GDP over 100%. Pre-COVID, we were at 70% debt to GDP. If, if How do you deleverage as a country? Yes, you can cut spending, you can raise taxes, but the other way you can do it is grow faster. If you thought labor force through immigration was going to grow faster, if you thought productivity growth was going to improve, that would be great news because it means we could deleverage not just by cutting, but another way to deleverage is grow a little faster right. and limit your spending. And so that's why these are so significant. And and need, the, those two forces are not, tend not to be inflationary. Uh, and so that's why I'm watching them carefully. I would imagine everybody at the Fed is watching them, but the jury's out. What about recession risk? You know, there's a lot of people that say, ha, huh, way over optimistic. Look at delinquencies have risen. Uh, there's all gonna yeah. be more, you know, uh, 
debt that has to be refinanced. Look how high these rates still are. Another reason why the Fed should realize that, you know, it did a lot of tightening and now it's got to pull that back. Uh, of course, and there's also financing the deficit, all these things. What do you see there, Robin? What do you hear? Because I know you still are talking to business people in your district and across the country. You're talking to people who are in uh, running projects in municipalities. So what's your sense of, of that side of the coin? Business is surprisingly resilient. Um, I, I've, you've heard me say the unspent ARPA money, the Inflation Reduction Act projects, the Infrastructure Act projects, are one of the reasons, not the only reasons, but one of the reasons that is keeping a bid for labor. And these are spread all through 50 states. And I travel a lot around the country. And in a local market, you announce a one or two or $3 billion, $4 billion project that needs 10 or 15,000 workers. It has a big effect. And so I think to me, it makes it more unlikely there's going to be a recession. Having said that, the other comment I'd make, which is beneath the surface, there are something like 55 or 60 million workers in this country that make, say, $55,000 a year or less. Uh, they are struggling, if, not to, to generalize, they are struggling to make ends meet. It is not easy to make ends meet. And the big four issues, food, rent, housing, and God forbid, health care. Uh, and so the reason you see uh, some questions about the consumer in spots is consumers are spending if you make fifty fifty five thousand dollars a year or less, but you're you you you're struggling to make ends meet, and you're making choices about what you're spending on. This is another reason why satisfaction with the economy seems surprisingly low, and the reason it's low is if you are making at that level, you've gotten wage increases, there's no question, but you've lost purchasing power versus say again, 2019. And uh, I think we're seeing that in some of the delinquencies you refer to and other data. Uh, we, we'd be wise to recognize there's a big swath of workers in this country where this is a very challenging period right now. And you can be sort of blinded by stock market going to record levels, you know, affluent people doing great, uh, uh, economy headline numbers resilient, but there's a lot of challenges with with uh, working people in this country today. So do you think the Fed has what it takes to stay the course and get inflation back down to 2%, should they? I They do. Uh, I mean, listen, they're balancing. Uh, they don't want to create a recession, but on the other hand, particularly after the transitory episode and maybe being uh, accused or feeling like they kept rates too low for too long, bought bonds for 20, 22 months too long. I think what they don't want to do now is stop, uh, for lack of a better analogy, on the five-yard line <laughs> and not wrestle this to the ground. And so I think they're very, very determined. And again, they have a dual mandate. People think they're worried about all these other things and they watch them, but ultimately they have a dual mandate, full employment and price stability. We're at full employment, okay? Yeah. Not perfect, but we're at full employment. So they have the luxury to be patient and stay the course and fight this inflation battle. And I think they will. So a little more technical, but very important to the markets and ultimately to the Fed's path is the balance sheet, right? It's it's pretty big. It's come down, of course, with the quantitative tightening, et cetera. Uh, and they're, they made it pretty clear at this meeting this week, they're going to start talking about what they do next. What's, what's the question and what kind of answer are we going to get? What kind of indicators are we going to get signals about what they're going to do? So the balance sheet got as high as $9 trillion. They're now, I think, in the mid-sevens. Uh, I think they're watching very carefully reserves and liquidity. And one of the ways they do that is, this is wonky, but this overnight repo facility, the usage of it tells them a little bit about whether there's still ample reserves and whether there's liquidity. They're watching it carefully. And that's why they're having this debate. And I think my sense is uh, this balance sheet runoff is going to slow down 
I don't know, somewhere between six and a half and seven trillion dollars. And you'll see them start to talk about setting the stage for that uh, and the pros and con arguments of it. And the second thing you'll hear them talk about, and already, you're already seeing it, is as they slow the runoff, do they want to shorten the maturity of their holdings or do they want to stay with current maturities? That question is a big deal particularly in a world where the U.S. government is selling $9 trillion of treasuries this year, uh, duration uh, of the Fed balance sheet, if they shorten it, it means there's less money to buy the 5 and the 10-year and the 30-year. And that may be one reason why, although it's not their job to monetize the debt, as I've said and they've said many times, uh, I think that'll be a, it's a factor to me in, in the thinking here. Are you, do you ever get, to me, it almost seems like a silly question. Foreigners always buy U.S. treasuries. You have to buy U.S. treasuries. It's the deepest, most liquid, safest, you know, sovereign bond market in the world. But uh, when you look at this, all, some of these uncertainties, uh, do you ever get concerned? Do you ever think that there's, that maybe the people who've been big bond buyers are not going to be buying as many bonds now and in the future? And that's going to be another issue for the deficit and financing it. Yeah, uh, listen, it's one thing for foreigners to buy U.S. bonds and pension funds globally and the Fed and banks to be buying. But what you've seen is the banks have pulled back for obvious reasons. It, it, it didn't go well, buying duration. The Fed is running off its balance sheet. Japan is reversing yield curve control. And the issue is not will foreigners buy, but is there enough demand to buy $9 trillion? of issuance, because that's what we're talking about. Uh, seven of that nine is refinancing, two is to finance the deficit we just ran. Uh, and these numbers are gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so I think all things being equal, people wanna be in US dollar, they wanna be in the treasury. The issue is to me, will they, will they wanna keep their duration shorter or will they buy, the big question, will they buy the 10 year, will they buy the 30 year? And that's why a number of people in the markets have cautioned that the term premium, we've had no, we had very little term premium for a long time. And maybe the term premium, in other words, the premium you need to get paid to buy the 10 year and the 30 year is going to go up. That's a big deal when you've got this amount of over 100% debt to GDP. Well, and another big deal here, of course, is this whole, oh, you know, and it, Yields got bond yields got so low. We all got oh geez three percent. That seemed kind of high. Four percent, but we can don't have to look far back to see bond yields used to be considerably higher. And that's another thing, higher for longer, not just at the Fed. But are we now? Should we forget about mortgage rates, thirty year mortgage rates at three uh, percent? Should we, you know, all that and realize no, you guys, we've kind of gone back to the future, and yields are going to stay higher, mortgage rates are going to stay higher, and of course the then the second question with the follow-up would be, and what does that mean for kids who want to buy a home? Are they going to be like previous generations that have to wait till they're 35 or 40 to buy their first house? So you've heard me say this for the last year. Uh, the Fed was out of position for a while. It's now addressed it. It's done a massive turn. And so uh, the world is obsessed with what the Fed is going to do. Is it going to be two? Is it going to be three? What's the timing? Okay. The tr because it's easy to understand. I think the bigger issue, to your point, for the U.S. economy and for the future is not at the Fed right now. It's how does the U.S. government finance mm -hmm. increasing and very high levels of deficits where interest expense is on its way to, not this year, but next year, probably a trillion dollars be the largest single item in, in the budget. I think that's that's the area we should be talking about more and focusing on more because to your point, it affects your ability to buy a home and more and get a mortgage and the ability of the US government to finance. And will that squeeze out higher rates on the long end? May that squeeze out other necessary spending, particularly on education, and other priorities that are vital to the country. That to me is the bigger question. And that probably should be discussed more. Yeah, fiscal dominance, that's one of the new terms we're going to hear more and more, right? But because you just mentioned education, uh, let's let's put on your hat as co-chair of the Draper Richardson Kaplan Foundation. 
um, tell us, remind us what it is you focus on and what are you focused on right now, particularly when it comes to education? That's something you've been putting in the equation for inflation and, and growth for a long time. So we are about a $85 million early stage social enterprise venture fund. We've been running this for about 13, 14 years. We tend to back 20 new ventures a year. We put one of our managing directors on the board. Uh, but to the point, why do we do this? Uh, we're looking for disruptive answers to problems in the United States and around the world. One of the, the areas we focus on is education. Uh, early childhood literacy in this country is a real challenge. Too high a percentage of kids, particularly in at-risk groups, are getting to first grade and they're not reading at grade level. So that means programs that uh, daycare where kids are read to, uh, full day versus half day pre-K, improving secondary education, improving skills training, improving the whole ecosystem. And I mentioned again, there's only two ways to grow. GDP is the sum of growth in the workforce and growth in productivity. Education is essential to helping people adapt and be more productive. And that's critical to the country. And since COVID, before COVID, we had our challenges. Since COVID, in the if you live in an affluent zip code, no problem. If you live in a more challenged zip code, the numeracy and uh, literacy uh, statistics are concerning. Uh, we're not improving. And in fact, in some places, we're still struggling. But that's the workforce of the future in this country. That's true in Texas. It's true in the nation. And so we spend a lot of time focusing on disruptive uh, interventions that could help address that ecosystem. And we work on a lot of other things, but education is one example. So if somebody was interested in, I don't know, investing, I mean, can people contact your foundation? Look at the, look at the website, Draper Richards Kaplan. And uh, we, 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 we obviously have a big donor base, but also we, we need superb people to be on boards of our organizations. You can make an enormous contribution by joining the board of one of these nonprofits. So we spent a lot of time recruiting board members and helping these nonprofits get advice and leadership on the board. And there's lots of ways people listening to this can get involved if you're interested, but just look at the website and uh, feel free to contact us. Also, you know, you've been busy with so many projects. Um, podcast, uh, what's, what's Rob Kaplan doing there? Again, if people want to uh, hear more of what you say or what more the kind of questions you are asking other people. Well, you know, I did we did a program at the Dallas Fed called Global Perspectives, and we did something like 50 interviews with prominent people. And it was fun and it was interesting. So I think we've done 10 or 12 more outside the Fed. So what's an example? Uh, Jessica Berman, who's the commissioner of women's soccer, we did an interview with. Uh, Wyman Howard, who was head of special forces uh, in the military, now retired, we did an interview with. The head of a nonprofit called Commit that is focused on improving education in the state of Texas. Uh, Jeb Bush, we interviewed, it was a fascinating interview because he's a very different side of him than people may realize. Very accomplished business person, very interesting to talk with. So those are examples. And I and I think I'm a fan of talking to people and learning about them. And sometimes you ask them questions, they wouldn't volunteer themselves, but if you ask them, they'll explain a little bit about themselves and it's inspiring and you learn a lot. Okay, well, busy man. Uh, and I'm sure you'll be busily watching uh, that uh, Fed decision and that j Powell press conference on Wednesday. And uh, so thank you for helping us get set up for that. Uh, we'll, again, dots and more. Uh, and Rob Kaplan, always a pleasure to speak with you. And we'll talk to you again soon, I hope. And uh, thanks for all you do. Great to talk with you. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for joining us here on Central Bank Central. I'm Kathleen Hayes.